All right, today is Monday, June 14th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. We have a lot to talk about because we didn't talk throughout the weekend. So grab yourself an adult beverage and let's talk. The market is still in a state of confusion. This is not just an important period for the stock market, but for the entire trajectory of the economy itself. There has been a lot of experimenting by the Federal Reserve and the federal government regarding the financial markets, the economy, in addition to the fiscal and monetary policy. And we are now reaping the fruits, or lack thereof, from these policies. Every action has a reaction, however far it might be delayed. The tsunami of liquidity that has been ushered by the Federal Reserve last year is starting to show its impacts in the broader economy, most importantly in the form of inflation. The market always cares about inflation, not because of inflation itself, but because of the monetary policy's response. In this case, tapering assets purchasing and raising interest rates if inflation gets out of hand. Mind you, this is a new territory for the stock market to be in. It hasn't dealt with a serious rise of inflation in many decades. The market is accustomed to the talk of tapering and perhaps raising interest rates. And the most recent example of the market's reaction to tightening the monetary policy was back in 2018. The economy was recovering. We have reached historic unemployment rates, prompting the Federal Reserve to taper asset purchasing and tighten the monetary policy by increasing interest rates. We know what the market's reaction was. It threw a fit. It was a massive flash crash right away because the market is far divorced from real valuations and fair asset prices. The market has been riding the sugar high from the quantitative easing unleashed by the Federal Reserve, or what I call the cocaine operation. So the market has to process tapering and tightening monetary policy once again, but now in combination with inflation something that we have not dealt with for a very long time because inflation at least in the earlier stages is not bad at all for the economy and matter of fact it is good for certain sectors of the stock market and that leads us to the confusion state for the stock market right now on one hand the economy at least on paper according to the bls aka the kitchen the economy is not recovering or creating new jobs as fast as expectations. On the other hand, when we got the CPR report regarding inflation, inflation is rising pretty fast, the fastest pace since 1992. So the market has to process all of that information. Is inflation rising and is it rising too much? And what about the transitory argument by the Federal Reserve that inflation will heat up for a significant period of time, but then it will cool down. Of course, the Federal Reserve doesn't give us any guidelines regarding how long that transitory period will be. We got the reaction from the bonds market last week. Matter of fact, before last week started, right after the non-farm payroll report, the bond market decided that bonds are oversold and there is no clarity regarding the trajectory of inflation. Is it transitory? Is it not transitory? and therefore deciding to go with the technicals. The technicals suggesting that bonds are oversold and overshorted. And right away, you saw heavy purchasing of bonds the last couple of weeks, pushing yields significantly lower, and perhaps indicating that at least for the bond market, it is buying the Federal Reserve's transitory argument. But we are starting to see the counter reaction of that overreaction. For example, today yields are blasting higher and bonds are being sold. So you have this tug of war between two corners of the market, the corner that believes the Federal Reserve's transitory argument and the other corner who believes that inflation will not be transitory. But in this state of confusion and lack of decision, technicals become extremely important. And therefore, a couple of weeks ago, I made a video asking, will the Nasdaq reclaim its leadership of the market? And this is exactly what we're seeing for now. At least for now. We have an important Fed meeting coming out this week. And if the Fed starts to talk about talking, about talking about tapering the cocaine operation and the market's reaction will flip 180 or who knows because tapering could freak out the entire market but when you go with the technicals in this period of lack of clarity 
indecision, confusion. What's overboard is the inflationary trade, industrials, financials, materials, and even energy. And those are the names that are being sold, profit-taking. Meanwhile, you have the high multiple names, the technology names that have been out of favor since the beginning of the year. Some of these names have been sold heavily. And going with the technicals, the market is deciding to buy the dip in some of these names, therefore boosting the NASDAQ, but not fading the inflationary trade entirely. And why is the market confused by such a large number coming out of the CPI report? The reason is that the CPI report kept the transitory argument alive. It is still here. It still has some leg to stand on, specifically when it comes, for example, to used car prices. I discussed the demand for used cars in details during the last video. But here is the important point to illustrate. Prices have risen too high to the point where they're pricing consumers out of the market. And therefore, you're seeing prices skyrocketing. But consumers all of a sudden saying, we're not interested anymore. This market is too hot. It doesn't make sense at all. We're going to wait till the market crashes or at least cools off. But here is the problem. Yes, that could be a transitory inflation in the used car market. Because if people say, hey, to hell with it. We're not going to buy used cars anymore. They're too expensive. Let's wait till prices go down. Prices will go down because the demand is slowing down. But the most important point to illustrate is the aggregate demand. Meaning, let's say that used cars prices start to drop. Will that ignite the demand once again? And if that is the case, then this inflation is not transitory because the aggregate demand is still too high. But if people say the hell with it and prices go down and they don't react, then indeed inflation was transitory in this case. And this is what the market has to process. There are also other aspects of this inflation that will not be transitory. Some of these are related to consumer goods prices, wage inflation, certain commodities prices will remain elevated and inflation in that case will not be transitory. The Federal Reserve says uh, largely, this is the new word by the way, largely transitory. It went from transitory to we got the tools to largely transitory. I don't know, can you use that in court? Hey, uh, your honor, I'm largely telling the truth. Oh, and by the way, my honesty is transitory. You think that'll work? Think again. So keep that thought about the used cars market in mind because we will revisit that thought during the futures coverage. We will talk about the housing market, which is becoming more important to watch than even the stock market. But anyhow, while the market is still confused, this guy you're listening to right now did not change his strategy one way or the other. The information we got for now are still supportive of the same outlook. Inflation will continue to rise higher so long as the Fed is not tapering. And if inflation rises significantly higher, that will have certain implications on the stock market. And I have been following this strategy since the beginning of the year, and it has been extremely rewarding. I'm not changing until the facts change. And that's the message of the day. Anyhow, we got a market to cover. So let's start by doing that. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down by 85.85 points or decline of 0.25%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 104.72 points or a gain of 0.74%. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 7.71 points or a gain of 0.8%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, technology at number two for the silver, communication services, aka Google and Facebook. And number three for the bronze, breaking with the theme here, energy. Today was not an inflationary theme, but energy held up strong. What about the laggards of the day, led by materials, financials, and industrials? The inflationary theme, the inflationary stocks are suffering still because the bonds market decided to go with the deflationary theme of buying bonds and appreciating the NASDAQ. What about the advance to decline ratio? The New York Stock Exchange, 34% advancing versus 63% declining. Awful breadth, the NYSE. What about the NASDAQ? 44% advancing versus 53% declining. So watch out here. We're looking under the hood and it's not looking so good. On surface, the NASDAQ and the market did pretty good. You saw the last minute rally by the end of the day. But under the hood, not looking so good.
Moving on to futures. What's going on here? We have crude oil prices stable, gaining slightly for the day, and crude oil prices are hovering above 70 bucks a barrel. So if you're saying that inflation is dead, it's over, let's party once again. Watch out here because crude oil prices are not dropping lower. Matter of fact, we're still in June and we're reading over 70 bucks a barrel. What will happen if we get to August and July, excuse me, August and September? Will prices rise above 80 bucks a barrel? That is still a possibility. What about softs? Bad day for lumber. Ooh, what a beating for lumber. Down by about 6% or so. And lumber already broken the very important critical level to keep of 1,000. And this is giving the deflationary camp, inflation deniers, the Federal Reserve's apologists a lot of stuff to celebrate and cream their pants looking at. But here's the problem. Looking at the technicals alone, we talked about the head and shoulder formation for lumber. And this is playing out for now. So number one, the technical were negative to begin with. Number two, just as our discussion regarding used cars prices in the intro of this video, when lumber prices surged significantly higher and you saw home prices following through, rising to mania bubble territory. In doing so, pricing the majority of potential home buyers out of the market because you gotta shell at least $200,000. And this is the down payment. You're putting a house as a down payment to buy the house. Prices are out of whack and in the hottest markets in the country, $200,000, that's not gonna get you anything. You can buy a Pizza Hut box to live in with $200,000. That's the down payment, baby. And you know what? Even with a $200,000, hundred thousand dollars down payment somebody's going to offer a larger down payment and perhaps buy it all cash we know corporations been doing that scooping houses across the country all cash what is their end goal what's going on here and how come nobody's talking about this issue of corporations scooping out properties and homes across the country pricing out the average joe and jane Lumber prices went too high, consumers demand stopped because they got priced out of the market and in return, home builders stopped doing their projects. They halted their projects until lumber prices go down and now we're seeing lumber prices going down. The demand dropped off the face of the earth all of a sudden. But here's the problem. What about the aggregate demand? What if we start to see home prices starting to go down? My hunch is that while a lot of potential home buyers switch to the rental market, there is a lot of aggregate demand waiting on the sidelines. The moment prices go down, you will see a massive stampede buying homes once again. It will never end because inflation, as the great Milton Friedman always said, is a monetary phenomenon. If the faucet of the Federal Reserve continues to flow, then inflation is not going to go anywhere. Because guess what? The stock market, these inflated asset prices in the stock market are supporting the housing bubble. All of these home buyers waiting on the sidelines to stampede once again and buy houses. What will happen to that aggregate demand, say the stock market crashes because the Federal Reserve decided to taper assets purchasing or start to think about thinking about thinking about tapering? A lot of these potential home buyers, and by the way, people who already bought homes and they're stuck with the mortgage, they did so out of confidence because their stock market portfolios are in la la land along with these stock valuations. What if the market crashes? Then it's good night, Irene. It's over. But so long as the stock market continues to rally higher and maintain these extreme valuations, I don't see the housing bubble bursting anytime soon. A lot of you keep asking me every single day, when will the housing market crash? When will the housing market crash? Well, it's not going to crash so long as everybody's thinking the same way. Let's hold off buying new houses until prices go down. Well, when prices go down, we're going to stampede again. The housing bubble will not end except in two scenarios. Scenario number one, and this is the soft crash scenario. The housing mania, housing bubble will pop the moment the stock market pops. The stock market will not pop so long as the Federal Reserve continues with the cocaine operation. It all goes back to monetary policy. The original fuel of inflation. So if the Federal Reserve decides to wake up and say, hey, those two last CPI readings, we're not happy about that. And we might start to taper in 2022. That will be the soft crash for the housing and the stock market. Scenario number two of the housing bubble popping. That's the harsh crash scenario, meaning the Fed says we're not going to do anything about anything. 
Oh, and by the way, where is inflation? We don't see inflation. Is it here? Is it over there? And even if it's over there, guess what? It's transitory and we get the tools, bro. If they continue to play this playbook, then the bubble will continue to grow larger and larger and larger and then crash and pop on its own. And that will be one epic crash that will perhaps spill over the entire economy, not just the United States economy, but the global economy and create an economic crisis, the likes that we have not seen since the Great Depression. Enough said. What else? Soft futures lumber down big. So did OJ, cotton, coffee, all declining by more than 2% today. Meanwhile, we have sugar futures declining by about 1.5%. And the only winner here, closing in the green, coca futures with gains of about 2% today. What about metals? Muted, playing poker, not saying anything. Gold not moving a lot. Silver not moving a lot. Copper not moving a lot. Waiting and waiting for what? For the upcoming Federal Reserve meeting. What about meats? We saw gains for feeder and live cattle futures meanwhile lean hogs futures the new tech the future bro perhaps uh, starting to face its own correction we'll see what about grains not a good day for grains massive declines across the board corn one of the most important axes of inflation dropping the case for corn is a little different than used cars and lumber either you have the crop or you don't you're not gonna print 3d corn and we know that the supply is not here. We have an extreme drought in the Western United States and even within the corn belt. So the output will be a lot less than last year, and perhaps the year before. But is the demand stopping? Is China all of a sudden not consuming uh, corn, not hoarding corn? Well, guess what? China, quietly of course, is dealing with another stage of the pandemic. There is a new variant floating around China. And the thinking is perhaps this new variant will slow down the Chinese demand. Now, if that happens, that is indeed deflationary, and it will ease the inflation in prices like corn, soybeans, soybean meal, even lean hogs, because China is the biggest purchaser of lean hogs. So this is one thing to keep in mind, and this is what's confusing the market, by the way. Certain things might look one way, but if one piece of the domino falls, the whole game goes 180. We also saw declines, big ones, for oats futures, Likewise, it was a rough day for rough rice futures, and we also saw declines for soybean meal, soybean, canola, soybean oil, and wheat futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, and here it is, the human beings are taking over once again. We have Apple, which is uh, not a meme stock, by the way, leading the options volume once again. With about 1.8 million contracts, about 77% of those were calls. Remember, Apple has been dormant and option premiums for these old school names. Apple, even Tesla. Tesla's old school now. Tesla's for boomers. Amazon, all of these names, the implied volatility was extremely low, meaning that the premiums were dirt cheap. And they started to notice that the gamblers at the casino, some very professional, by the way, and they started buying calls. And these calls are appreciating quickly in value. Meanwhile, here is the uh, apes market with AMC finishing at number two with about one and a half million contracts traded today. About 66% of those were calls. And notice the volume for AMC bouncing higher once again. It was down trading less than a million contracts last week. And now it is bouncing once again. And this is important because we talked to the apes and we said, look, you want to keep this gamma squeeze going on and on. You want to go to the moon, continue to buy call options because buying the stock is not going to do anything. It's not going to squeeze the, the suits, you know, the shorties, not going to do that. However, if you continue to buy call options, then this squeeze can go on for a little longer. And the reason is when you buy the stock, you're buying one share. When you buy the call options contract, somebody else, the market maker, has to buy a hundred shares to hedge against those call options they sold. So if we see the apes continue to buy call options in this name, they can maintain this mania for a little longer. The moment they seize 
to buy call options, that's when the whole game will come down crashing. And here it is at number three, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 570,000 contracts, about 62% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? Starting with the ticker INTC, this is for Intel. We saw a lot of trading in options for this name for some weird reason, who cares? In this case, they're buying the 62 calls, expiration date July 2nd, with expectations that the name will rise over 6.5% by then, and they paid 27 cents apiece to enter the straight. All in all, bringing the total to about $1.6 million. What about the trade for the ticker IWM? This is the Russell 2000, which became a meme ETF. And this is one way you can bet against the meme mania without assuming a lot of risk. In this case, they're buying the 218 bucks puts expiration date June 30th with expectations that the name will drop by over 5.5% by then. They paid about 75 cents a piece to enter this trade, bringing the total to about $1.5 million. What about the trade for the ticker C? R S R. This is one of these names that got mentioned on Reddit. You know, the Wall Street bets, those uh, quote unquote kids, you know, kids in their 50s who happen to work for hedge funds. They floated the name and it was trading with significant volume today, whether it is stock volume or options volume. And this is a brilliant trade to capture the mania while assuming very little risk. And I followed this trade, by the way. They bought the 42 calls and they sold the 45 calls expiration date june 18th meaning this friday and they are expecting the name to pop higher but not more or shall we say exceeding 25 percent and they paid about a buck and 10 cents a piece for the 42 and a half calls they bought and they collected about 90 cents a piece in credit from the 45 bucks calls that they sold all in all, the total entry cost for this trade was about 20 cents, and that brought the total all the way to about $280,000. You're only risking 20 cents to join the mania. Of course, we know that option contracts, well, they trade in contracts, and each contract has 100 options, so you'll be spending about 200 bucks to buy one contract, but you're only risking 200 bucks to participate in the mania, perhaps you can double your money or even triple your money if this trade works. This is a lottery ticket and this is the difference between experienced and seasoned traders and between brainless apes. The brainless ape buys and huddle forever, thinking that they're fighting a holy war against the hedgies and the shorties and sticking it to the man, bro. And it's gonna be worth uh, $500,000 a share. Okay. Whatever you say, bro. But I'm just getting in and out, making a quick buck. This is a lottery ticket. I made my vig in, out, hello, goodbye. Speaking of, here's another ticker, and it's uh, you for Unity Software. We saw heavy activities in the options market for this name today. This is one of the trades. They're buying the 115 calls, expiration date July 16th, with expectations that the name will rise over 12.5% by then, and they paid about a buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $2 million. What about the trade for the ticker QQQ, the triple Qs, the NASDAQ? stack just in case you didn't know while everybody's anticipating that the nasdaq will blast higher here is somebody betting that the nasdaq will do 180 and reverse to the downside perhaps right after the fed's meeting if the fed hints one way or the other about any potential of tapering you're gonna start to see a freak out forming in the stock market primarily in the nasdaq so in this case, they're buying the 321 puts expiration date June 30th with expectations that the name will drop over 7% by then. They paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $750,000. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker COIN? This is for Coinbase. We saw cryptos blasting higher today, specifically Bitcoin. And perhaps this is resurging the bullish bets for Coinbase. In this case, they're buying the 260 calls expiration date June 25th with expectations that the name will rise over 9% by then. They paid about two bucks and 65 cents a piece to enter this trade. 
All in all, bringing the total to about $1.6 million. It's just money. Who cares? You win, you lose, so long as you're having fun. And this is why we call it the casino. Moving on to the heat map analysis. Right away, the theme is very clear. The inflationary trade is being faded. We're seeing profit taking in these names. Whether we're talking about financials, regional banks, industrials, names like Deer and Caterpillar. Similar story with the materials. Freeport McMoran, steel names, agricultural names, not performing so hot so today. Meanwhile, magically, the energy sector, the only inflationary sector that managed to hold some gains for the day. And perhaps that's telling that the energy sector is saying, wait a minute here don't rush to judgment because a the xop and energy names already corrected a few weeks ago meanwhile financials industrials metals been riding high since the beginning of the year some of these names are overcrowded overbought and too extended for example caterpillar alcoa certain steel names i showed you the charts during last video but when we look at exxon mobil and british petroleum chevron these names have been consolidating for a while not riding impulsively higher so they face the correction ahead of time if the energy sector continues to outperform financials industrials materials and even defensives then perhaps Perhaps this reaction of fading the inflationary trade in favor of the deflationary trade of technology in high multiples is what's transitory. And we will see a revival of the inflationary trade once again the moment we get updated with the macroeconomics data pointing to higher inflation and sooner tapering. The picture is extremely clear. You have big cap technology names, Apple joining the party that has been absent last week, not performing as well as the broader Nasdaq. But this week, Apple joining the party, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, all outperforming. Tesla, another one. The high multiple names, software stocks, the IPO names, semiconductor names, cybersecurity, all outperforming today. All of these high multiple names that got whacked since the beginning of the year when inflation expectations ran higher are now getting rewarded. But there are pockets within the tech sector that managed to underperform today. And these are related to the value names. Names like VMware, Oracle, Cisco, IBM, Dell, all of these names underperformed today because the market reverted. Remember the two path, the two ways chart? The market is reverting to choose the deflationary road, which doesn't include the value names, even within the tech sector of the market. And if you're looking at the two roads, the market has to choose from well the market made one choice today abundantly clear the other road includes the reopening stocks they're not doing so hot so along with the inflationary stocks whether we're talking about airlines cruises hotels casinos retail even the value names that were running hot like ford giving up a lot of gains today mind you on thursday the market did exactly the same thing following the deflationary playbook of buying the dip in the Nasdaq, the software names, the IGV, semiconductors, the high multiple names, and fading the inflationary stocks, financials, industrials, metals, etc. Whether that is uh, transitory or not, that will depend on the Federal Reserve's meeting. There could be a Goldilocks scenario, and I hate that term, but I'm using it anyways for the Nasdaq and the mania names. And that is, we're done with an unfarmed payroll report. We're done with the CPI report. And we're done with the Federal Reserve and the Fed decided to do nothing. Papa Jerome comes out and says, well, I'm waiting for a new report. I'm waiting for the next CPI report to make up my mind. In the meantime, let's continue to party. Hit it, DJ. And the Nasdaq, the high multiple names, continue to ride higher and higher. The Nasdaq marks all-time highs and everybody jumps up and down. Inflation is gone, etc., etc., until we get the next CPI reading. So the strategy for this guy you're listening to right now who's overweight with inflationary stocks is number one, hedging my current positions. We talked about that in a separate video. Number one, you can take profits off the table. Number two, you can sell puts. Number three, you can buy puts as insurance. In the meantime, Meantime, if the party is going to shift from the inflationary stocks back to the Nasdaq, then I will be participating via call options. But my core portfolio remains the same, and the reason is the macroeconomic outlook did not change, at least for me. We're skipping the themes analysis 
in interest of time because I'm recording this late already. So let's move on right away to the charts analysis. Starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. We talked about the important level of 423. The S&P 500 finally managed to capture 423 as support. It has been consolidating beneath 423 for days and days and days building up that energy to break above that level once and for all and it did the same thing the exact same behavior when creating the important level of 420 consolidating beneath the level for days and days gathering energy and once that energy is available it gets unleashed to the upside moving on from one resistance level turning it into support to meet the next resistance level which was 423 now that level is behind us what does that mean it means that the sky is the limit and the reason is we have to let the chart to tell us where the next resistance level is we cannot figure it out we can use some fibonacci replacement we can use some cute tricks but at the end of the day you gotta wait for the chart to show you the next resistance level so far the market traded down throughout the day but at the end of the day we saw the magic blue pill being injected in the market by you know who pumping the market higher by the end of the day and all we know for now is that 423 is the support we have to wait for the chart to show us the next resistance level that could happen as soon as tomorrow what about the daily perspective for the futures chart and this is a 30 minutes chart once again the equivalent of 423 on the spy in the futures chart is 4232 the chart consolidated over and over and over again knocking and knocking and knocking and finally it made it through and now it's trading above that level what does that mean the sky's the limit we know the line in the sand is 4212 and a half if the chart reverses and breaks that support level then we will have a nasty correction ahead of us but so long as the chart maintains 4232 as support then the sky is the limit we have the double bottom formation resulting in that massive surge higher along with the blue pill injection will it maintain this rise higher by tomorrow that depends but for now the formation the setup is favoring the bullish side what about the cues 30 minutes chart gapping higher in the morning going down to close the gap and then reversing higher an extremely bullish signal and if you are a day trader that was the green light right there and then to buy calls or even to buy the nasdaq right away buy it dump it by the end of the day this is what day traders do but these are the signals that they look for closing the gap and bouncing higher very bullish for now we know that the support is 340 and the center of gravity moves to 300 excuse me 330 and a half meaning the gravity is still to the downside but we need to see the next resistance level to make that assessment where is the next resistance level we don't know because the chart is breaking out we have to let the chart to choose and show us the next resistance level before adjusting the chart what about the daily chart of the futures contract finally trading above 14,000 all-time highs pretty much we have the double top so this always has been a very sticky level of resistance a very strong resistance the expectations are that the nasdaq will not be able to just blast through that level without paying it the respect it deserves the chart failed twice in surpassing and closing above that level decisively the assumption is that it will fail again until it does the opposite until it manages to close above that level for the week 14,000 a weekly closing above 14,000 will cement the all-time highs with the cues absent of that you gotta be careful for now the technicals are extremely bullish the momentum indicators are all diverging higher the chart is trading at all-time highs the volume is not so high meaning that the path of least resistance is higher for now it looks very good for the nasdaq what will happen after the feds meeting that's up for grabs what about the iwm small caps we still have one gap that hasn't been closed yet and unlike the spy in the queues we have a nasty reversal candle for the russell 2000 aka a gap and crap moving higher in the morning but closing pretty much at the lows of the day now there are a lot of technical analysts that look at the iwm as a leading indicator and if that is the case then the spy and the Qs will follow the footsteps of the iwm i'm not a subscriber of that theory but it works sometimes and it makes these uh, technical analysts very excited for now the chart did not close the gap and it popped higher just slightly by the end of the day reversing before closing the gap is a bullish signal when the chart is trending lower 
meaning that the chart is not ready to close the gap and trade below that level. Likewise, when a chart is trading higher and then it fails, it reverses before closing a gap, that is an ominous signal, meaning that the chart is not ready to close the gap and trade above that level, and therefore that is usually an ominous signal. And the opposite is true on the downside. Moving on to the daily chart of the Russell 2000, the RUT. Nothing is going on here. We're trading above 2,264. The bulls have the advantage. And the assumption is, if they close again above that level for the week, then the IWM will trade higher. The IWM is riding higher along with the meme stocks. Meme stocks go higher. Russell 2000 goes higher. Meme stocks crash, we will see a lot of pain in the IWM. And therefore, this is becoming a proxy for trading meme stocks, which is a sad day, but this is the world that we're living in. What about the dollar index? The Dixie. Remember, right after the CPI and since the non-farm payroll report, while the bond market spoke loud and clear in favor of the deflationary slash transitory argument, the stock market traded a certain way, but one chart kept the mystery alive is the US dollar. The dollar isn't speaking until now. It is actually popping higher. We saw a massive pop higher on Friday, and now it is maintaining that pop. What does that say? The US dollar is popping higher in anticipation of tapering, meaning that the currency market read things differently than the bond and the stock market, saying perhaps it is not transitory. And we will see tapering happening sooner then later, we need more confirmation. And that confirmation will come out from the US dollar recapturing the 91 support level, now resistance. And the reaction will be clear, by the way, right after the Fed's meeting. If the market expects tapering, perhaps Papa Jerome will say, hey, you know what? I'm starting to think about thinking about thinking about tapering. Doubtful, but what if? If he does that, the US dollar will blast higher. But again, the US dollar is not waiting for Papa Jerome to say, yes, I'm tapering. It's going to read through the bullshit if dollar traders believe that the Federal Reserve is bluffing and it is closer to tapering, you will see the reaction right away. I trust the US dollar and gold more than I trust the bond and the stock market's reaction because the US dollar and gold has been mature regarding the non-farm payroll and the CPR reports. The bonds market decided to move ahead of time. It already made the decision even before the CPR report. That is impulsive, is extreme. I don't trust that kind of behavior. I trust the more mature behavior. And this time around, the mature behavior came from Tricky Dixie and gold. Speaking of, gold is going down back to the Fibonacci retracement level of about 1,850. Gold rising higher, just slightly. Gold reversing lower. And now we're seeing yields popping higher again, reclaiming 1.5%. What does that mean for gold? Gold losing momentum. And if the old correlations hold, meaning the inverse relationship between gold and yields, and the inverse relationship between gold and the US dollar, the classic relationship, the assumption is that gold will trade lower. So watch out here. The Nasdaq is rallying higher. The stock market saying, I'm going to go with the transitory. I'm going to take profits from the inflationary trade. I'm going to buy the dip in the Nasdaq and the high multiple names. The US dollar and gold saying, watch out here. Not too fast. Not too fast. Let's wait and see, because the CPI number was hot, no matter how you look at it. It is slightly above expectations, but it was hot to begin with. So watch out for gold and the US dollar. Forget about the stock market. I trust gold and the stock market. These are, excuse me, the US dollar. These are my leading indicators, not the bonds market, not the stock market. And here it is, yields. We had the classic reversal signal. You had one massive green candle followed by another massive reversal candle, the red candle. That was the reversal right then and there, right after the CPI report. When now the chart is back trading at around 1.5%. The assumption is that it will be able to break above 1.5%, but that reversal zone will become a new resistance zone. And it will be tough for yields to trade above that number absent of a catalyst and the catalyst could come very soon right after the fed's meeting what about the tlt once again this is a weekly chart we have higher lows that is on the bull side but on the bear side it is still a bear flag formation and are we about to see a reversal to the downside before closing the gap and if that is the case we already talked about it reversing before closing a gap on the upside is an ominous signal and a leading indicator that the chart is about to reverse and register 
lower lows this time around. So we're waiting and waiting to see what happens right after the Fed's meeting. But now, all of this massive bond buying and believing the transitory argument did not result in sparking the great short squeeze. It didn't happen, meaning that the shorts are still confident about their positioning. What about the VIX? The VIX going up and down, up and down, sliding slightly to the downside, but it is starting to find a footing here. And the question is, when will the next pop in the VIX be? Remember, the pops in the VIX, usually, not always, we spotted some of them, but the pops usually come out of the blue. A surprise element thrown in the mix a misinterpretation of something, perhaps said by the Fed. Who knows? But the VIX needs a catalyst, and usually that catalyst happens out of the blue, and we see the pop higher. For now, I see the momentum indicators, the MACD and the RSI stabilizing and readying for a pop higher. It doesn't make sense for now, because we just talked about the SPY, the S&P 500, and we said the sky is the limit technically speaking. But when you look under the hood for the VIX, the VIX is not dropping by much. The VIX is holding ground, and that is contrary to the behavior of the S&P 500. For now, the bulls, the market bulls, have the advantage until and unless the VIX start closing above 20. And my hunch is the pop will come out of the blue, not anticipated. Who's anticipating the VIX to pop higher right now as the SPY, the S&P 500, just broken above all-time highs? No one, no one is expecting the VIX to pop higher and the SPY to reverse to the downside again. But this is exactly when the VIX pops. Moving on to Apple, 30 minutes chart. We talked about closing the gap and trading higher. That is a bullish signal. Apple has been consolidating over and over for weeks now, in or around 127 and 128. Today, he finally found the courage to trade above that level after consolidating for a long time, gathering energy, and now popping higher, extremely close to the next resistance level of 131 and we talked about the options market the call options buying is recovering for apple and this is a good signal that the chart will have enough energy by the end of the week to close above 131 what about tesla the souffle what's going on here tesla making a higher low and the momentum indicators the macd and the rsi are diverging higher this is the daily perspective by the way we know that the resistance is 629 and the chart failed before to close above that level. And it has been proven that 629 is an extreme level of resistance. Now that the chart made higher lows, what does that say? It says that the chart is looking to challenge 629 once again. And when we talk about 629, we're not talking about the oven's temperature. That will burn the souffle. We are talking about a technical level of extreme importance. For now, it is acting as resistance. If the chart manages to close above 629 for the week, that level and that strength will turn into support. That will be an excellent floor for Tesla shares to start trading higher. That is the assumption. We still have a few more days to trade here before the weekly closing. What about the tulip market? And we are covering Bitcoin this time around. You know the news. Reverend Elon Musk created a lot of enemies. He stabbed his culties in the back. The tulip cult embraced Reverend Elon in the beginning, but once he turned against them by pointing out the environmental damage crypto mining does, specifically Bitcoin mining, all of a sudden Reverend Elon and his nasty cult faced head and head with another nasty cult, that is the cult of tulips, specifically Bitcoin. And in this one, I'm grabbing the popcorn and watching the fight. Go at it, no problem at all. Reverend Elon and his cult are a nasty bunch. They perhaps met their match in the Bitcoin cult. And they successfully turned up the heat on Reverend Elon, and now he's feeling the pain and the pressure. So what does he do? He decides to go and flip 180 once again, saying, you know what? Tesla's going to accept Bitcoin payments so long as the mining, or at least 50% of the mining, happens via clean energy. That pleased the market, and you saw Bitcoin trading higher. Now, the problem with BTC is it is investing in tweets. You're a tweet-based investor, and you're betting on one man's tweet tweeting activities and that is reverend elon musk what if he's uh, playing a prank sucking in the bitcoin bulls to buy the dip once btc trades above 40,000 45,000 reverend elon comes out and says tada tesla decided to dump their bitcoin holdings or i changed my mind 
you know what, now I'm thinking I'm not going to accept Bitcoin for Tesla purchases anymore. You're at the mercy of this psychopath. So watch out. And here is the last chart of the day I want to talk about because I tweeted about good RX stock. The ticker GD rx in your face while everybody's busy chasing clover and amc gamestop here's a stock heavily shorted over 30 percent of the float is shorted yet the business is not that bad and the valuation is okay it's bad but it's okay the company should be trading at about five billion dollars and now it is trading at about 15 billion dollars but it has a better balance sheet better cash flow and positive growth year over year in their revenues Contrast that with the ape's favorite, AMC. The business is trading at a valuation of about $25 billion, even $30 billion. Meanwhile, revenue is actually shrinking year over year. The balance sheet is horrible and the cash flow is pretty much non-existent until the retail mania started. So I like the setup here for good RX. Heavily shorted, but the financials and the technicals are not that bad. Perhaps bottoming. And if this stock starts to take off, perhaps it will spark a short squeeze rally taking the stock to the moon for now we have lower lows and lower highs a descending trend line but what if the chart is bottoming here and it is about to go all the way to challenge the trend line in the process creating higher lows and sparking the short squeeze rally it is possible and therefore i bought calls in this name today now remember you and i are human beings with the functioning brain cells so we know that these are lottery tickets the meme stocks and the likes you get in for a trade you make your vig and you go out. Unlike the baboons and the chimps, the orangutans, the gorillas and the likes. They want to stay there forever. Hoodle forever, bro. Until the stock hits $100,000 a share or we end up getting whacked and we end up holding the back. We love bags. We like holding them. Makes your biceps bigger. So there is a benefit after all. Even if you lose your money, who cares? You got bigger biceps. You can climb trees now easily. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Tomorrow we have retail sales and here it is, a very very important number. Perhaps this one will have more implications in the market than the CPI reading. We're talking about the PPI, the producer price index. If that comes out hot, then forget about transitory because now we're talking about a market where prices are rising significantly higher with no stop in sign, meanwhile struggling to create jobs. Either this is stagflation or we're about to hit the last act in this inflation, wage inflation. Once that happens, it's over. God forbid your wages go higher. Ah, now we're going to end the game. Now we're going to start tapering. We're not going to even start thinking about thinking. We'll just taper right away. How dare you dead beats? You know, the common man and woman. How dare you get paid more? Then here it is. We have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. Another very important inflation indicator. And then we have industrial production and business inventories. All of these are leading indicators for inflation. So expect the market to move in the morning. But the ultimate event, and perhaps what will keep a lid on the market's reaction tomorrow, is the upcoming Federal Reserve announcement that is coming Wednesday, June 16th. If the PPI in the Empire State Manufacturing Index comes out hotter than expected, then the assumption is NASDAQ goes down, yields pop higher, and the inflationary trade, ta-da, back in favor. But I believe that even if that is the case, we will have a lid kept on the reaction of the market because the other side will argue, well, wait a minute here. We don't really care about inflation. We care about the Fed's reaction to inflation. We care about tapering. And while all of these indicators might, might be pointing out for higher inflation, so long as Papa Jerome says, keep it cool, I got the tools, then tapering is not going to happen and the party goes on. And therefore, you don't need to make major moves one way or the other in your core portfolio. Trade what's going on, but what I'm doing at least, not making any major moves in the investment side of my portfolio forget the trading and the gambling that is in every portfolio i know you said i don't gamble bro no 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 no. you're a degenerate gambler you know it and i know it there is a degenerate gambler inside every single one of us so you gotta satisfy that degenerate gambling side of yours by participating via call options or perhaps small amount of shares in the meme stock mania in the revival of the nasdaq the arc invest etc etc. But for now, until we see what the Federal Reserve wants to do, this is the plan. Anyhow, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, 
please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.